So I'm going to now introduce you to Derwin. Derwin is a farmer, same as, uh, as Richard. Um, and he's producing linseed as part of a mixed farming system. Um, and he's had this long, I think about 15 years, interest in, in fats and its influence on our health. He's born and raised in Sussex. And educated, he says, in the University of Life on the family farm, which is a good place to be educated. And he moved to where he is now, Moncton Home Farm, in the late 1970s, where he still farms. And he's very much involved in the local uh, community. For example, he's the founder of the local Rotary. He started to grow and press and sell linseed in 2000. And this prompted his interest in food and health, and particularly the importance of the omega fats. He's a well-informed and enthusiastic health food campaigner. He's a director of the Brighton and Hove Food Partnership, on which he's the only farmer. He sits on the steering committee of the Brighton and Sussex University Food Network. He's a member of the BFLA. Um, and he's also a senior member of the Royal Society of Medicine, which I think is interesting that we've got a farmer there. Uh, and he recently held a <coughs> two-day event on dementia and Alzheimer's at the farm, which was attended by GPs. This is one of the many topics that he addresses in, in his upcoming book, and he's, there's a little pamphlet here that he's a taster that he's produced, which I think you can buy on the PFLA stand, or maybe here for a couple of quid, just to get you... Or maybe I even ought to say, if you want one, please take one. All right. <laughs> he's a big-hearted guy. Um, anyway, it, it's called The Farmer Will See You Now. Isn't that such a lovely title? <laughs> the Farmer Will See You Now. For which an introduction this sort of blah, blah, blah. The demand for his lengthy products has risen dramatically since the start of his campaign, and his engagement with the public and personal services at the heart of the farm's activities. And if I put all the emails that I've had with Derwin about fats end to end, it would be a very long thing. It's wonderful. Derwin, you're such an enthusiast. Off you go. Do you remember when you were called fathead at school? Um, you do? Uh, <laughs> All the time. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it actually wasn't an insult because your brain is 60% fat. So my view is, shouldn't we know how to feed it? And I don't think we do. So another part of this little discussion today is to turn you all into KPIs. Any idea what KPIs are? Key performance indicators. <laughs> well, you're not going to be a key performance <laughs> indicator, are you? But what you are going to be is a key person of influence. <laughs> so you're going to go away from here today with some information that can help you be healthier in your life, but it also conveys on you a responsibility. And that means when you see people doing things wrongly, which I hope I'm going to explain to you, that you will be able to say, no, stop doing that and do it this way because it's going to be better for you. Okay, so... Where do, we, where do we start? Well, we're all kind of Stone Age people still, and we came from the middle of Africa, the Rift Valley in Africa, where pasture-fed animals were abundant, and you've got your omegas from nuts and seeds and plants, as well as the animals. And it, we, it's done a pretty good job, really, up until the time that uh, Richard starts talking about it, when it all kind of falls apart. We evolved reasonably well, um, but now... Of course we're not. So why is it? Why, why is this happening? <coughs> so I thought I'd better just give you a little bit more information about what omega-3 and omega-6 is and the role that it plays in the body. Well, Richard spoke about ALA, which is in the plants, and um, DHA and EPA. Well, the ALA actually is an essential fat. And they're called essential fats for just one reason. Anybody know what that is? Mm. They're essential <laughs> uh, yeah, you're, the body doesn't make them exactly that's the reason uh, so the ones from fish because there weren't any in the Rift Valley in Africa were there but you needed EP and DHA for the, your body so you were given the ability to make it so that's the kind of difference there and, and you'll, have, you'll have people telling you as Richard showed that we don't maybe convert enough of the ALA to EPA and DHA but I think we clearly did produce enough because we've evolved reasonably well. So I'm not sure about that. And the other thing that leads me to doubt that a little bit is, especially you ladies, you tell me when you start using linseed, you, you notice your skin, hair and nails improve. So that shows me that linseed is actually systemic. It's going right into the body and manifesting itself in 
nice shiny hair, which I don't have any. Uh, so, <coughs> so that's a, that, a little bit about how that works. But he, he also mentioned about the um, inflammation. And omega-3 in the body always produces anti-inflammatory hormones. And although omega-6 starts off producing <coughs> inflammatory ones, as soon as it gets out of proportion, and I think the proportion is like our Stone Age one, which was one omega-3 to one omega-6. As soon as it gets out of that proportion, um, the omega-6 starts producing arachidonic acid, and that's the route for inflammation. So, really important to know about those things, but how is it coming into our food chain? Well, John and uh, Richard have told you of the importance of pasture-fed. <coughs> Of course, what's happening to a lot of our animals now, they're being fed the byproduct of making soy oil and corn oil and all that sort of thing. So the fatty acid balance of the animals that you eat are likely to be different. Uh, so that's going to have an effect on you. And for all you ladies, <coughs> omega-3 is actually quite important in another way because it's the only substance in a woman's body that when you're pregnant, the baby will take it all. And... Uh, um, maybe some of you have felt a bit, if you've been pregnant, a funny and some, something called baby brain. Your brain can shrink by up to 20%. So you're doing a pretty important job when you're creating new life. You're building new cell membranes. And that's the other thing that's really important between omega-3 and 6. All the cell membranes, well not ev every part of it, but omega-3 and omega-6 are really important parts of creating those cells. And what you're wanting to do is create cells that are flexible, so they talk to each other, that are resilient, so bad things don't go, uh, can't get into. And um, I'm informed by this uh, part by a lovely um, German lady called Joan Budwig, who came after another German uh, scientist called Otto Warburg, who looked into respiration cells. And um, what he found was if you deprive the cells of just 35% of the oxygen they need, you're likely to get cancer. So oxygenation of cells is really important. And Joanna Woodfig looked at that in a more scientific way. And she found <coughs> that the proper balance of oils and fats in your body helped your body to oxygenate itself. And she went on to develop a protocol to help people with cancer that... Um, uh, required mixing uh, linseed oil and linseed meal with cottage cheese and quark and, and that going into your body really uh, helps you to oxygenate your body and as you all probably know that cancer is anaerobic it doesn't like oxygen so if you're well oxygenated uh, maybe you're less likely to get that and um, you know it's in, in these last sort of 50 or 60 years when we've moved from uh, cooking in lard or dripping uh, to cooking in oil that's when we've moved from 1 in 20 getting cancer to 1 in 2 uh, and some of uh, good evidence for that was when when um, Dr. Uh, Richard Doll was looking at the evidence for smoking and cancer he made one, st uh, one statement which was almost all cancers not caused by cigarette smoking was caused by food so lots of people knew we were doing the wrong kind of thing there. And um, <laughs> so we need to have that right balance of fat. So the Institute for Feeding the Brain for Behaviour think that there might be 1 to 50, the imbalance between 1, but between 3 and 6. But averagely, maybe in, 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 all, in all of our diet, in all sorts of ways that we can't see, hidden, hidden fats, there might be 10, 15... 20 times more uh, omega-6 averagely coming into our diet and because we suffer from such inflammatory problems you know that's just got to be true you know you don't need a scientist to show you that we've actually done all the experiments we've um, experimented on ourselves for that period of time and now we've got a huge amount of illnesses and um, Yes, my, my membership of the Royal Society of Medicine doesn't convey anything other than I was able to pay the, just the <laughs> joining <laughs> fee. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say that because it doesn't mean that I've got any kind of authority about that. Um, but I was there at um, 
a, a two-day conference about diet, nutrition, and the brain a little while ago, 250 delegates, and I was able to ask a couple of questions, which was really good. But at the end of the sessions, when I asked a question, I had a queue of people wanting to talk to me. You know, what's a farmer doing, coming uh, and interacting in uh, uh, a, a conference like this? But one of the things I did say, I did ask about, was practically all the research that's done when they're talking about research with people, they often don't say, what's the fatty acid balance of all of these people we're going to involve in this trial? And it seems to me, because I've, I've explained to you how important it is to build your cells properly, um, you really need to know that. Because if whatever question you're asking, whether it's your control group or some, or given a, a, a medication or a placebo, you need to know what sort of fundamental uh, balance of fats that they've got in their body to have any realistic answers. And that actually produced quite an interesting uh, number of responses from the panel. Um, finally, a, a lady said, oh, well, you know, we've got to take the blood to do this and it's all too complicated. So, so <laughs> we don't do that. But there's a, another guy in <coughs> Sydney University a little while ago looked at um, uh, pregnant obese women and he measured the artery walls of their babies and already, already they were thickened like cardiovascular functions. So that's kind of lipid transfer. So it does, it is important to know what fats you're putting into your system. But do labels help you to work out what that is? Do you think they do? They don't, do they? They talk about saturated fats, monounsaturated fats, and polyunsaturated fats. What, what good is that to you? You haven't got a clue what it means, I don't think, yeah. averagely. Has somebody, have you got a clue what it means? Not really. Not really. <laughs> so, but what's important to you is to know how much omega-3 there is in the product, how much omega-6, has it been heated up and fooled around with? Yeah. Um, and um, <coughs> increasingly you'll see palm oil in everything, from biscuits to, to, to goodness knows what. So <coughs> you can't, uh, you, that might lead you to think that maybe the um, Food Standards Agency and the label people trading standards are um, somehow in league with big pharma to ensure that we still get plenty of food that keeps us ill. <laughs> um, because I think that's what's going on. And we need to kind of change that. And so my, my hope is um, that you will all help uh, to do that from here on in. So when you see somebody roasting their potatoes or frying in oil, and this, I also criticise my fellow rapeseed farmers here because I generally say to people, you know, this is better than olive oil, you can cook your potatoes in rape oil. And it's not true. It damages the structure of the oil, and then you, your body, can't do what it needs to do, which is build your cell membrane flexibly and resiliently. And um, you know that the, um, the flexibility is about cells talking to each other, and now we've got apparently 25% of people with mental health problems in this country, haven't we? That's the function of your brain. So the function of your brain, what does it require? It requires cells to talk to each other. So me, as a just simple man, I think that, hang on, if we've got all this mental health issues, maybe we haven't been feeding our cells properly so that they can talk to each other. And if you really just analyse that a little bit farther, you could say, I think, that maybe a lot of the rest of us are suffering from varying degrees of non-identified mental health issues. I, I, I'm, I'm not immune from that myself, possibly. Um, so, uh, and one little demonstration of that, I think, is they, they talk about uh, girls and boys at school having lots of body image problems and other difficulties. And they'll say, oh, well, if we don't address these and somehow deliver an answer, um, that will lead to mental health problems in later life. How about if it's actually the other way around? And we haven't been feeding our children and mothers properly, so we're producing brains that are resilient and are able to react and, and um, uh, have proper relationships with other parts of the community. Does that make sense, do you think? So there's a big job to do, isn't there, to get these things right. So, and the, the omega fats are really important. And if, if you're to campaign or help to do anything, we need to have labels that reflect what's in the food in a better way so we can understand it. 
but we also need to know from our own point of view how to utilize that information and I hope I've given you a little bit more uh, information uh, on that front as well and um, my sister actually died with breast cancer uh, so it's something I'm quite passionate about myself uh, you know, a little bit of, of this but um, what actually killed her was the mammogram um, and it hurt her because 60 pounds of weight squashes women's breasts I don't know whether you guys know that that's more than a building labourer can pick up on a building site and that hurts women and I think if it was us you know, we wouldn't be promoting that idea and um, uh, it hurt her you see so she didn't go back for another test and by the time they found it it was really too late but what I'm saying it doesn't mean you, you don't want any kind of screening you could be screened by thermal imaging or ultrasound or even your dog um, <laughs> dogs are able to do this kind of thing and there was a professor in Scotland who wanted to do a trial with that in the hospital but they wouldn't let him do it unfortunately so those things are uh, of, of interest to me and the, the reason I'm more interested in because of course the work of Joanna Goodfig and her, her um, uh, work with, with cancer and how we need to protect ourselves and I'm not sure whether anybody knows this but in this country there's a 1939 Cancer Act hands up anybody know that? no? Um, and what it says 1939 this is that's a long time ago if you get cancer and you go to oncology, there's only three things you can do for you. You can operate on your chemo, chemo, give you chemotherapy or give you radiotherapy. That's not an integrated approach. And if he said, hang on, let's have a little look at this, maybe we can do some lifestyle changes and do some meditation and alter the food that you eat, we might not have to go through the chemotherapy process. He could be struck off. Do you think it's right that we should have a law that says that when we really need an integrated approach to all sorts of disease? And of course, my way of having an integrated approach, right, which is this, let's think about the food first, and it's us farmers um, that are producing that. Um, farmers produce a lot of fats, you see, so when you see those fields of yellow, which Richard has shown you, they are fields of fat. The fields that I produce, blue fields, also fields of fats, and when you see the animals grazing, over the green fields, they're also different kind of fats. Um, we kind of need all of those, um, and we need them in, in the right balance, uh, and we've got to learn about how to do that. Have I, have I given you any kind of a clue what to look at and think about um, on, on that front? So, I will just go, how, how long have I got now? A well, few minutes? A couple of minutes, please. <laughs> The Mediterranean, people talk about the Mediterranean diet, aren't they? And, and, that's and your farm and Alzheimer's, the visits on the farm you need oh. to mention. Right. And then we can... <laughs> Alright, quickly about that. Yeah. Um, the Mediterranean diet, and they say it's because of olive oil. Actually, it might be because there's not so much sunflower oil and corn oil and rape oil used in the Mediterranean area. So they're not giving themselves a lot more omega-6 in their diet. But I think you see plenty of Italians and that kind of people, and that's probably too much pasta. They so, also eat a lot of fish, yeah. Sorry? They also eat a lot of fish. They eat a lot of fish, so they're getting some omega 3 from fish uh, as well. And lard. What? And lard. And lard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, the, um, the events we have at the farm, we, we have uh, events for um, practitioners um, uh, as well as gen general events, and uh, we had this one for, from Alzheimer's when I linked up with a naturopathic nutritionist and we just advertised it in a in a normal way for everybody and in fact we had quite a lot of practitioners and a couple of a couple of doctors came which was really quite unbelievable so messages from the farm I think are really important and we we've, we've been denigrated as as, as farmers uh, but we do the most important job which is producing food for life and I'm, I'm happy to be shot at at any time. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I just maybe yes, questions yes out there and then yes. It's not uh, okay. Thank you very much for that. And I like this uh, KPI key person of influence because it now gives me uh, now I as an individual. That's You're empowered. Phrase. 
that's the phrase I need to say what to justify for myself why I'm here. Yes. Okay? Not just out of vague interest. But one thing, a name that I found absent in this discussion is met is the nutritionist or Dr. Yudkin, who I believe had talked about the value of fats and was outcast, as it were, and now is maybe being brought back into the frame. Maybe. Yeah, um, Professor John Yudkin. The, the role of uh, the, uh, the negative role of sugar, but he was. Yeah. Put to I mean, sugar that, that committee that I drew your attention to, John Yudkin was on that committee in, when it met in 1974, and he stayed on it between 1974 and 1984, and <coughs> DEFRA and the Department of Health kicked him off the committee before they had that meeting. Uh, he actually complained bitterly about that. I've, had, I've, I've met his son and his, um, his uh, nephew, both of whom are retired professors. They didn't work in the same area. But uh, I mean, Yudkin got it right back in 1974 with his book *Pure White and Deadly* about the fact that what most people forget is that sugar converts into glucose and fructose, and those convert into fats in our bodies. And we forget that the, these refined carbohydrates—and it's not just sugar, white bread, white rice, a um, number of things, processed food—they turn into glucose very, very quickly. And actually, the fructose, which is fruit sugar, is probably even more harmful than the glucose because it's fine in sugar, in fruit, when it's got all the fiber with it, which slows down the absorption and the digestion. But when you take it out of, the fi of that and put it into um, fizzy drinks or whatever, it's a completely different situation. Okay, thank you. Then I'll go to the gentleman on the back. Uh, no, that's lady first. Yes, yeah, so I've been reading a really interesting book uh, called Guts by Dr. Julia Enders. And I would like to clarify something that you were saying about arachidonic acid and that is specific to the different omegas. Because in that she says that animal fats contain overall more arachidonic acid, which is converted into pain neurotransmitters in our bodies. Linseed and hemp seed, conversely, contain more alpha-linolenic acid, and olive oil contains a similar uh, acting substance called oleocanthal, both of which are anti-inflammatory. And I was interested in... The first speaker was quite talking a lot about anti uh, animal versus vegetable, but I didn't hear much about um, olive oil and a, or coconut oil, which I'm most interested on. <coughs> and um, another thing I wanted to say was Quickly. I've heard olive oil blocks an enzyme called fatty acid synthase, which is what our body creates fat out of spare carbohydrates. And I would like to know about olive oil. Uh, and also, like, I really appreciate what you said about mental health, but also to flag up, like, patriarchy is really bad for people's body image and things like that. That's interesting. Okay, well, very quickly, Richard. Okay, um, I mean, obviously I had to cut down what I was saying very, very, you know, I couldn't go to any of the books in detail. Um, the, the benefits of olive oil are that it's a, it's, it's a mono, it's largely oleic acid, which is monounsaturated. Omega-9. So if, if you, if you, sorry? Omega-9. Yes. If you if you're trying to um, if you want it, in terms of actually I mean the big problem for society is that we don't get enough omega three. Mm -hmm. I mean our principal source of omega three is oily fish, and only seventy percent of the population eat the recommended one portion of oily fish a week. There's a large proportion of the population eat no oily fish a week, and for those people there's a huge deficiency deficit of omega three, and we've really got a sort of global crisis with not enough omega-3. Now, what I was just making the point about olive oil is that when you look at the essential fatty acids, it isn't even good there. It's, it's a much higher proportion of omega-6 to omega-3. Uh, but in other words, I mean, it's promoted because it doesn't, it's not got much saturated fat, and therefore they think it's like a sort of neutral fat. But in terms of actually a source of omega-3, it's not good. But I would say there are a few vegetable oils that do have very high levels of omega-3. Either hemp oil or linseed would be, yeah. would be another good one. Uh, but I don't know enough about, I can't really, I'm not an expert on that, I can't really comment, but I think the trouble is that there's only limited amounts so they're not going to solve the national problem of a shortage of omega-3. Right, there's so many questions. And, uh, <laughs> they will stay around at the end, but I did pick on yeah. you, sir. I've got a very important point as well, about, especially that pig, looking at that pig, that in the 1930s as well, you know, people uh, had a lot of uh, fat, but it was local fat from pigs that were grass fed, or uh, you know, any animal that was grass fed local, yeah. and it wasn't fed antibiotics as well. And how much meat did people eat then? They ate a good fat, but what are the quantities that they ate? Very small amounts, I reckon. Okay. And, but what is very important is that nowadays, 
a lot of animals are, are <coughs> catch very intensively and are fed antibiotics in a very small dose. But that's, there's a very good book, Missing Microbes, and everybody should read that. And that is a very big point that we're not, our microbes aren't a, uh, able anymore to pr process all the food that we have and limited uh, diversity of food that we have. Okay. All the microbes in your gut should weigh the same as your brain. And we've got very heavy brains, haven't we? <laughs> so that's uh, quite incredible. And, and the California. And they're upset now by antibiotic intake. Yes, and, exactly. And we don't pay enough attention to it or no. know how to pay attention yeah. to it. But the California Institute for Technology recently said that they thought that Parkinson's disease was likely to be caused by bacteria from the gut. And that's what they're going to find about Alzheimer's as well, yeah. I think. Missing micro. Okay, we are ready to. Your point. Well, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, I did have a few more slides which I didn't show because the time is running out. But I mean, what this is, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you go back, the thing was that the, the, up until the 1950s, in fact, pigs were largely out and getting some grass, and therefore the, 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 their balance of fats would be even better than it would, you know, would be from pork today. And what, what happened was effectively, with, but we almost got rid of the Herefords as well as the free-range piece of, piece, of, piece, of, piece of pig that are making a bit of a comeback. Now that they, they, they've been bred to be super lean, mm -hmm. and farmers like me are penalised very, very heavily if we send an animal to market that's got a bit too much fat on it. Well, it's completely the wrong way around. <laughs> we need to actually have animals that, 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 that have a bit of fat on them and we should be using that fat in our diet. But the point problem about pigs was it, it was a conspiracy I think between the farmers union and the government they wanted to intensify agriculture they wanted to bring the pigs indoors it isn't that you can't keep large white and land raised pigs outside in nice little huts. The problem was that you can't keep pr traditional British big breeds of pigs indoors with their back fat on because they get too hot and that's why they had to be got rid of. Okay, and people who don't want to eat animal fats but are interested in sort of health and sustainability have turned to coconut oil and I'd be interested to hear a bit more about your thoughts on coconut oil, especially in regards Great. to Great. Cook with that by all means, use it, put it on your face, good for your brain, uh, but have some linseed as but well. Not <laughs> Coconut oil is not local, but no, of course it's yeah. but, but isn't. But it's a good thing, and, and it's your only choice, really, if you're like vegan or vegetarian. Because linseed oil is not available. Linseed oil is available, I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> as, 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 you know, if you're vegetarian and, and, um, uh, or, or uh, vegan, you, you're likely to have less omega-3 in your body it's really hard to find and get it in, into people and, and it needs to be fresh but coconut oil it, well you can all use coconut oil um, to, to cook with instead of lard or dripping if we want to and I'm not we're not saying that <coughs> you should be doing all of your cooking and using tons and tons of lard um, but you um, just don't fry or roast in oils where you damage them Dirk Taylor from Royal Technica. About um, 13 years ago, I was putting on a lot of weight and I checked out on John Yorkin and I swapped uh, what was supposedly a healthy diet to a very low carb, very high fat diet 13 years ago. I lost three stone in three months and I've been healthy ever since. So I think the carbohydrates component needs to be pulled out a lot more, yeah. particularly um, if, you, if, if you add a high carb and a high fat diet. Uh, Jeff Bowler, doctor in Ohio State, has shown that that can cause even more problems. So you need to drop the carbs as well as increase the, the fats. I certainly concur with all, all the information about the fats. But the other information about um, Ansel Keys, they've actually found a recent discovery of a paper that he wrote before the dietary guidelines and the Southern Country study, which he actually showed to his data that um, saturated fat increased cholesterol but mortality was unchanged. So we actually buried that. It's just that is true, yeah, that's quite true, yeah. Uh, I came across a lot of this information through reading Sally Fallon's Nourishing Tradition, which I think was written in the late 80s. And she makes a really interesting point about um, hy that hydrogenated fats actually hydrogenate the, your cell walls. Is that something that you've come across? And well, it's just not natural, is it? It's not natural. So <coughs> the margarines 
um, are not natural and, and all of these spreads you know that oil liquid at room temperature turned into a solid why on earth would you do that why would you want to do that you just want to learn about how to use the oil and use it in an appropriate way uh, and, and then you'll be okay well, the comment that was made is correct isn't it that those those facts create very dense uh, <coughs> oh yes yeah absolutely they're un unable to be used you hearing this richard Yes, I'm 90 percent of it. <laughs> I'm a student dietitian from Nottingham. Um, we are we are taught, you know, through the BDA's advice and um, the NHS Public Health England, to recommend two portions of oily fish a week. We're not taught, not in my course. I found out myself, but not in my course that pasture-fed cattle have the right balance of omega three to six. I presume there's published evidence on that. And yeah. my my point really is just a plea: we need at more access to pasture-fed dairy and meat on exactly. the market. People need to be able to buy it. It's hard to find. So please bring your pasture-fed meat. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just put that in context with this slide here for May. The, the red line is, is, these are all paired experiments where you had a, um, you know, 100 cattle or something, they twisted on them at random and they fed them on grass and they took, the other 50 were fed on grain. And the red line shows, shows, shows the actual ratio of omega-6 to mm. omega-3. So that in this group it was 9 to 1, 13.6 to 1, 10.4 to 1. There is one U UK study where the steers actually had 20 times more omega-6 than omega-3. Now the green ones are the grass-fed ones, and their ratio is, is more or less all below 2 to 1. Now it's recommended that our nation, our actually we shouldn't eat more than four times as much omega-6 to omega omega-3. Nationally, the average is about 16 to 1, and there are some people on very bad diets who are eating significantly more than that. So the problem with grass-fed meat is it doesn't have a huge amount of omega-3, but it has it in absolutely perfect proportions. Mm -hmm. Now, there's still dispute in the scientific community about whether it's the actual total amount of omega-3 or the ratio. The, 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 the balance of evidence suggests that it's the ratio, but it's not yet settled scientifically. Can you say a little more about um, heating, uh, <coughs> heating animal fat versus plant-based fat? Um, so large... Do you want it to disturb when you... Yeah. Uh, should I do it? Heating, heating, yeah. 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 So cooking. Yeah, d d don't... The, the best thing to think about is if it's liquid at room temperature, don't heat it up. Don't worry about this is high smoke point yeah. or the, where the smoke point. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Yeah. Just don't heat it up and use your lard or dripping or coconut oil. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you need to be yeah. butter or ghee. Or butter. Or butter or ghee. Yeah. Goose fat. Or goose fat. <laughs> 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 any animal fat. There's lots, there's lots of them. <laughs> All right, I, I've got to talk first because we're under, under please sit down there. Right, I, I'd like to thank Richard and um, Derwin very much, both farmers again. I think this is great. This is farmers talking about, um, about these issues. Thank you very much. A huge amount of knowledge here. And I, I'm just wondering, Patrick and uh, Richard, whether there's something that... This is such a huge subject and people queuing at the door that together, PFLA and Sustainable Food Trust, we can't actually do another gathering where many more people could come, much more time, lots more slides here. And create more KPIs. Yeah, and you can't, <laughs> this guy could talk forever. Um, so I think that, that's probably the way forward. We try and think of a way that we can, we can do, uh, do, do that. Thank you ever so much for coming. Um, we've got to clear the room, but these are two identifiable gentlemen, and they're either going to be here or they're going to be out, well, outside somewhere uh, to continue the...